Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss female mate choice in sexual selection. So let's jump right in. <laughs> We previously met sexual selection in The Seal's Tale. There, we discussed the law of battle in which males physically compete for control of the females. We also discussed the concept of sex-limited genes, so if you're unfamiliar with those concepts, go back to watch that video. Today, we're moving on to the other mechanism of sexual selection, female mate choice. Though Darwin mentioned female mate choice in On the Origin of Species, he had no explanation for why it happened. No explanation for why female birds choose males with certain songs or colored plumage. Darwin famously said in an 1860 letter to American botanist Asa Gray, quote, The sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, it makes me sick. Close quote. What Darwin meant was that the peacock's tail clearly did not evolve as an adaptation to its environment, whether as a defensive weapon for camouflage, competing physically with other males, etc. Rather, it seems to be a hindrance to survival as the peacock's tail is an exquisitely colored target for predators. Since the whole point of natural selection is to select for features that reduce the likelihood of being killed before reaching reproductive age, how could the peacock's tail possibly evolve? This question pestered Darwin until he came up with a brilliant solution, which he published in 1871 under the title The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. Female birds choose males who are aesthetically pleasing. The peacock has his suite of colors purely because the peahen likes them. This same reasoning applies to male great argus pheasants presenting their inverted umbrella of feathers to a female, or groups of male mannequins performing elaborate rituals in front of females, or male bowerbirds creating nesting huts for females, as well as all the caws, hoots, whistles, and songs that males make. Most other zoologists, though, including Alfred Russell Wallace, rejected this hypothesis. Ironically, Wallace was more of a Darwinian than Darwin himself was. Wallace even said so, quote, in rejecting that phase of sexual selection depending on female choice, I insist on the greater efficacy of natural selection. This is preeminently the Darwinian doctrine, and I therefore claim for my book the position of being the advocate of pure Darwinism. Close quote. Instead, Wallace and most zoologists until the 1970s argued that there was necessarily some underlying reason females like certain colors, dances, or sounds. The male was not simply advertising that he has the prettiest feathers, but that he does not have intestinal parasites, or he can gather the most twigs to make a nest, or he can produce the healthiest offspring, etc. This debate has historically divided researchers into two camps, one side with Darwin, also called the good taste side, and one side with Wallace, also called the good genes or healthy offspring or good sense side. In fairness, valid points have been made on both sides, but let's not fall into the conceptual trap of monocausism, where only a single factor is seen to be the controlling one. So what are the facts? Many studies have been done linking external morphology and behavior to physiology, vindicating Wallace. For example, one study showed that male black wheat ears, Onanthe leucura, that were able to carry many and heavy stones to a potential nest site had a stronger T-cell mediated immune response than other males. And research on the gray tree frog, Hyla versicolor, has shown that males with longer calls sire healthier offspring compared to males with shorter calls. However, Ronald Fisher provided the conceptual, and later biologists like Andrew Pomiankowski, Yo Iwasa, and Sean Nee, the mathematical, foundation for aesthetic mate choice vindicating Darwin. Quote, Certain remarkable consequences do, however, follow if some sexual preferences of this kind, determined, for example, by a plumage character, are developed in a species in which the preferences of one sex, in particular the female, have a great influence on the number of offspring left by individual males. 
In such cases, the modification of the plumage character in the cock proceeds under two selective influences. One, an initial advantage not due to sexual preference, which advantage may be quite inconsiderable in magnitude, and two, an additional advantage conferred by female preference, which will be proportional to the intensity of this preference." Close quote. In other words, males will at first be chosen due to some character not related to female aesthetic preference, such as having the fewest parasites, but once females do hit upon some aesthetic value, they will continue selecting for males with that feature. However, there is a limit to how extravagant feathers and crests can be. Once a feature becomes too cumbersome to support, natural selection will dominate over the effect of sexual selection. One of the most famous sexual selection experiments involved the brightly colored guppy Poecilia reticulata. Researchers constructed ten ponds, four had guppies and the relatively innocuous killifish Rivulus hardii, and six had guppies with the predatory pike cichlid Crinicicla alta. In the guppy killifish ponds, the number and size of bright blue and iridescent spots on the guppies rapidly increased. Conversely, in the guppy pike ponds, the number and size of the spots rapidly decreased. The colorful spots were disadvantageous in environments with predators, but were preferentially favored by the guppies themselves in the predator-less environments. Thus, we can see a trade-off between sexual and natural selection. But what if females choose mates simply because they can maintain large, cumbersome features and survive to reproductive age? Being able to survive to reproductive age with large ornaments is surely indicative of the male's vitality, which is why females should want to mate with him. This hypothesis has a name, the Handicap Principle, formulated by evolutionary biologist Emmats Zahavi. In recent years, the Handicap Principle has been vindicated, at least to an extent. However, in a review paper from last year, Penn and Zamato laid down the argument that Zahavi's handicap principle is often misunderstood and confused with a distinctly different hypothesis that Zahavi formulated later. This second hypothesis, which Penn and Zamato dubbed condition-dependent signaling or strategic choice, wasn't completely original as similar ideas were proposed earlier. Both ideas intend to explain the existence of honest signals. Peacocks possess characteristics that function as the signals, that indicate their quality to potential mates. However, if such signals are beneficial, then what prevents any male from cheating? I.e., everyone will use the same signal regardless of their quality. The handicap principle maintains that signals are honest and less prone to cheating when the associated traits have a high cost and put a penalty on survival, and that such traits are favored by a different type of selection called signal selection. Once such high-cost signaling traits have been fixed in the population, the trait acts as a handicap for the individuals that have to bear them. Such signals aren't subject to cheating because poor quality males are unable to bear the cost of this handicap and they don't survive. In contrast, condition-dependent signaling holds that signals are honest indicators of quality when the degree of expression of the associated traits is dependent on the quality of the individual. In this case, the signaling traits exhibit phenotypic plasticity. Instead of each individual being destined to spend a fixed cost to produce the signal, the given quality of an individual and environmental conditions determine whether one will produce the signal or not. Phenotypic plasticity minimizes the fitness cost such that poor quality males and even high quality males under poor environmental conditions are still able to survive by avoiding the cost of producing the signal if needed. There is no handicap in this scenario. The signal will be reliable and favorable by selection if, for high-quality males, the benefit gained by the signal outweighs the cost of producing it, while in poor-quality males, the cost of the signal outweighs the benefit. To reiterate, the handicap principle would say that the peacock's tail functions as the signal that indicates they were able to survive despite being burdened with having to grow and carry the tail around all the time. The condition-dependent signaling hypothesis would say that the peacock's tail conveys the message that they are strong and healthy enough to have developed and maintained the tail. The difference seems rather very subtle, which is why they're often confused, but the differences are important. The former says that any trait could function as an honest signal if it imposes a high and fixed cost of survival on each individual, while the second hypothesis says that a more restrictive set of traits, those that put a relative fitness cost on cheating, 
can function as honest signals. This would also include signals that are impossible to cheat, i.e. traits that are physically linked with quality. It would also predict that secondary sexual traits are phenotypically plastic, unlike the former handicap principle. One objection raised against sexual selection has been that since females would only choose the prettiest males, that means the genes of just a select few males would be passed on in each generation. Within a relatively few number of generations, there would be no genetic variety, which would be costly to the population. However, there are processes that prevent this inexorable drift towards uniformity, such as mutations and parasites. For one, harmful mutations are more likely to occur than beneficial ones, so mutations are more likely to occur that slightly disrupt an organism's ornaments than ones that make it more attractive. Second, the Red Queen hypothesis enters. Parasites are constantly co-evolving with their hosts, so a host genotype that protects against parasites one generation might not work the next generation. Other selective pressures, as well as individuals migrating between populations, will also likely contribute to the genetic variation within a population. But it must be noted that the handicap principle only applies in the second part of Fisher's scenario. The principle comes into play after female mate choice has resulted in some ornament becoming exaggerated as a result of its aesthetic value. While we can obviously see sexual selection in birds and fish, how has this process impacted human evolution? In short, hominins have had a, to put it mildly, complex sexual history. Remember from Artie's tale that Australopiths are highly sexually dimorphic, but the earlier Ardipithecus isn't. Instead, Ardipithecus ramidus is considered to be sexually monomorphic in both body size and the size of its canine teeth. The later Australopithecus complicates matters, as it is sexually dimorphic in body size but monomorphic in its canine teeth. This suggests that male competition was lower in Ardipithecus, but picked back up again in Australopithecus, a roller coaster of hominin dimorphism. Further, as we saw in the seal's tail, members of genus Homo display low but noticeable sexual dimorphism. Human skeletal morphology is indicative of largely monogamous matings, but our testis size seems to indicate that sperm competition is prevalent among humans, leading to the suggestion that humans have practiced some relatively minor degree of polygamous mating in our evolutionary history. For one thing, concealed ovulation hinders male-male competition in humans. For anyone who is unaware, marsupial and placental mammals have recurring physiological changes induced by reproductive hormones called the estrous cycle. The estrous cycle starts at sexual maturity and occurs usually until death. Importantly, about midway through this process, ova are produced in the ovary and travel down the fallopian tube to the uterus. This part of the estrous cycle is called ovulation and takes about a day. Meanwhile, the lining of the uterus, called the endometrium, thickens to allow implantation of the ovum where it can be fertilized. Typically, if no conception occurs, the endometrium is reabsorbed. However, a few mammals, such as humans, chimps, several other primates, a few bats, elephant shrews, and one species of spiny mouse, undergo a menstrual cycle rather than an estrous cycle. During menstruation, though, the endometrium is shed rather than absorbed. For humans, this cycle repeats about every 28 days. Part of the estrous cycle is also confusingly called estrus, but spelled slightly differently. During this time, ovulation occurs and the female becomes sexually receptive. In many mammals, the female shows outward signs of receptiveness, such as labial reddening or behaviorally soliciting males. But curiously, humans don't. They have concealed ovulation, meaning females don't show outward signs of ovulation. For that reason, estrus is essentially continuous in humans, in which copulations occur for 23 of the 28 days. In chimps, copulations occur for 12 of their 37-day cycle. Concealed ovulation prevents any dominant male from monopolizing all the females because he has no way of knowing which ones are ovulating, and this also results in more even sexual access for males. Instead, males are forced to mate guard one single female for the entirety of her cycle, and this is the only way to ensure paternity. As a result, each male can only monopolize a single female, and the female reaps the benefits in the form of parental investment once the offspring is born. In this way, concealed ovulation may be partially responsible for the evolution of monogamy in humans, particularly given other monogamous primates display a sort of concealed ovulation as well.
some researchers have tried to measure the relationship between sexual selection and sexual dimorphism. Early attempts, quote, assumed that the adult sex ratio was proportional to the strength of sexual selection, reasoning that competition should be proportional to the number of females per male available, close quote. However, this calculation was overly simplistic. Later calculations amended the math to compare reproductively available males to reproductively available females. This resulted in the new operational sex ratio, or OSR, which is defined as the, quote, number of reproductively available males to reproductively available females for non-seasonal breeders, close quote. This metric better explains sexual dimorphism in primates. The reasoning goes like this, quote, when females gestate and nurse for several years, having a long interbirth interval, there should be more competition among males for those few females that are ready to mate. In addition, when females conceive within a few estrus cycles and there is a brief estrus period, there will be fewer mating opportunities and more male-male competition. Close quote. So, original and revised estimates of the OSR matched pretty closely for most primates. For example, in the gelata, Theropithecus gelata, there are about 12 reproductively available males for every reproductively available female. By contrast, in hylobatids and calotrichines, there is only a single female available for each male due to the intolerance females show to one another. Females refuse to group due to fierce competition for resources and males cannot monopolize large harems. The sexual dimorphism differences between these categories is stark. Gelata males are twice the size of females but hylobatid and calotrichine males are monomorphic. Sexual dimorphism then is driven by male ability to monopolize females and female desire to group. However, because the human mating system is a bit more complicated than that of other primates, researchers split the total reproductive span into two types. The physiological span, when humans are physically capable of reproduction, and the behavioral span, when humans are actively engaging in mating. Interestingly, these numbers differed a bit. The physiological span OSR turned out to be almost 9, while the behavioral span OSR turned out to be almost 12. So, theoretically, we should have sexual dimorphism on a scale similar to the gelata, according to the math, but we don't. Human weight dimorphism is about the same as that of chimps, yet our OSR is twice as high. Why might that be? One reason is that menopause drives up our OSR by removing females from the reproductive pool, which changes the time at which males are able to mate. Extending estrus and concealing ovulation, however, reduce the OSR as well as male-male competition. Concealed ovulation may also have driven our species towards increased monogamy, since males are unable to monopolize multiple ovulating females. But with monogamy comes increased female mate choice, since females are understandably going to be choosier about the partner with which they mate long term. To that end, females often select mates that are intelligent, caring, friendly, and able to invest resources. Males, by contrast, have clearly selected females who possess reduced visible body hair, a particular distribution of adipose tissue, gracile and youthful features, and higher voices. The former reflects the general female decision to invest in a mate that can aid in the success of her offspring, while the latter may reflect the general male decision to copulate with females that are decidedly still capable of reproducing. In this way, female physiology in the form of both concealed ovulation and menopause have drastically impacted the human mating system. But perhaps females also selected males for reduced visible body hair. From here on, we will use the term hairless in reference to humans, but actually humans are covered in hair like most mammals. Instead, our body hair density is normal for a mammal of our size. In fact, there is a negative correlation between body size and hair density for mammals. Instead, we have very fine, short hair that is difficult to see, hence hairless. Humans are the only primates with this degree of hairlessness. The other mammals that are notable for their lack of hair are elephants, rhinoceroses, hippopotamuses, walruses, pigs, whales, and naked mole rats, and as you can see, most of these are semi-aquatic. This has led some researchers to suggest that hominins went through a semi-aquatic phase deemed the aquatic ape hypothesis. However, the evidence for this hypothesis is, to put it mildly, lacking. 
There is to date no paleontological evidence for such a phase and quite a lot of fossil evidence against it. Another commonly cited hypothesis is thermoregulation, which was first argued by anthropologist Peter Wheeler in the 1980s and 90s. The idea is that after hominins adapted an upright posture, losing their hair would help prevent overheating. More recent models have incorporated long distance running, showing that as long distance running increased in hominins, locomotor efficiency, evaporative cooling, and hairlessness were positively selected beginning with Homo erectus. Another hypothesis is that hairlessness reduces ectoparasite load. Humans are often infected with the head louse, Pediculus humanus capitis, or the body louse, Pediculus humanus humanus, which are closely related to lice that similarly infect chimpanzees and bonobos. By contrast, the crab louse, or pubic louse, Therus pubis, is most closely related to the pubic lice of gorillas. Biologist David Reed co-authored a paper on the bizarre phylogenetic relationship of African ape lice with the punny Miltonian title, Pair of Lice Lost or Parasites Regained. This reflects the question of whether great apes ancestrally had both pediculus and therus, or whether humans gained therus independently. The answer appears to be the latter. The parasite phylogeny matches the primate phylogeny pretty closely, indicating host-parasite co-speciation, with the exception of the human pubic louse, which jumped from gorillas to humans. At any rate, the ectoparasite hypothesis posits that Homo erectus started becoming more hairless not only because they were protected from the elements by fire and constructed shelters and to more efficiently thermoregulate, but also because hairless skin could serve as a window by which to judge the health of an individual. It is an honest signal of health in the same way that a peacock carrying around a large train is. An individual with both less hair and fewer ectoparasites was seen as healthier or more virile than an individual who had more of both. Retaining hair on the head and face are more probably the result of sexual selection, and hair in the pubic and armpit regions might facilitate the dispersal of pheromones. Next, the evolution of bipedality has been attributed to female mate choice. As we mentioned in Artie's tale, maybe bipedality was favored as a way to display one's genitals. It's certainly possible, but this explanation is rarely invoked in anthropological literature. However, Darwin was a proponent of this idea. Finally, has the evolution of hominin brain size been impacted by sexual selection? Possibly. The sustained increase in brain size over the past two million years seems to imply a positive feedback loop in which brain expansion leads to more brain expansion. Hypotheses for what drove the expansion include, quote, sexual selection for intelligence accelerated by a fisherian runaway process, within group competition for social status which boosted the evolution of increasingly elaborate Machiavellian intelligence, and ever-increasing between-group competition in a highly social, ecologically dominant species, which resulted in accelerated evolution of cognitive abilities needed for effective within-group cooperation and group-beneficial behaviors." Close quote. Recently, another hypothesis has been added onto these called the Cultural Drive Hypothesis. This hypothesis posits that, quote, "...enhanced cognitive abilities, especially the abilities for social learning and cultural transmission, of adaptive behaviors can accelerate biological evolution. Smarter animals invent new adaptive behaviors more often and transmit them across generations more effectively. New cultural traditions create new selective environments in response to which animals evolve faster." Close quote. These enhanced cognitive abilities result from increasing neuronal circuits and thus a larger, or perhaps denser, brain. Memes have been incorporated into this hypothesis too. For reference, memes are ideas, behaviors, or styles that spread from person to person by imitation and carry a symbolic meaning. Richard Dawkins coined the concept of the meme in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene. Dawkins contends that memes are analogous in some ways to genes. Memes mutate, are selectively imitated, and give rise over successive iterations to new memes. Dawkins and others hypothesize that perhaps brains that can carry more memes were selectively beneficial over evolutionary history. And fun fact, the sum total of memes contained within a brain is called the memome. Memes as a scientific concept have not been without their critics, but that's a discussion for another time.
Before I conclude this chapter of The Ancestor's Tale, I would also like to mention another book from a different author. In his book, The Vital Question, Nick Lane tackles the origin of life and the origin of eukaryotic organisms. It's a very good book, but for this video I would like to mention specifically what he said that is relevant to sexual selection. It concerns the mitochondria, which, whenever mentioned, are obligatorily called the powerhouses of the cell in eukaryotes because their central function is to supply the cell with energy from the food that we eat and the oxygen that we breathe. Specifically, electrons are taken from the food molecules like glucose, and these electrons are passed down a chain of protein complexes which together are aptly named the electron transport chain. At the end of this chain, the electrons are taken up by oxygen, which causes the oxygen to react with hydrogen ions, producing H2O, i.e. water. While traveling through the electron transport chain, the electrons progressively lose energy. This energy release causes the protons to pump hydrogen ions, also called protons, across the membrane. This produces a proton or pH gradient. In other words, there are more protons on one side of the membrane. This means that, given the opportunity, protons will move back along the gradient to reach the same concentration on both sides. Another enzyme called ATP synthase does exactly that. It provides protons a passage to flow back, but as they do, it makes ATP synthase spin, and this spinning causes the enzyme to turn ADP into ATP, which is the central energy carrier that powers other vital processes in the cell. But what has all of this to do with sexual selection? The genes that code for the subunits of the electron transport chain proteins are not all together in the same genome. Some genes are in the mitochondrial genome, while others are in the nuclear genome. This is significant because the subunits have to work together in order for the electron transport chain to work properly. So the nuclear and mitochondrial genome have to be compatible. Their compatibility is maintained through coevolution, where mutations in one are compensated for in the other. However, after a long time of divergence, different compatible sets of alleles that coevolved independently may no longer be compatible with each other. Hybrids that inherit an incompatible set experience problems such as mitochondrial diseases, reduced fertility, and inviability. An example of this is observed by Ron Burton and his research team who study the copepod species Tigriopus californicus, where they hybridize individuals of different populations that have been reproductively isolated for a long time and show extreme divergences in mitochondrial DNA. While the first hybrid generation seem normal, if a female of the first hybrid generation is mated with a male that is part of the same population as its parents, then the resulting generation were described by the researchers as being in a, quote, sorry state, close quote. It became even worse when females of the second generation were again mated with a male from the original paternal population. However, the opposite happened when a male of the second hybrid generation was mated with a female of the original maternal population. They were back to normal. Why would this be the case? Remember from Eve's tale that mitochondria are inherited maternally. Only the mitochondria of the egg cell are inherited, while those of the sperm cell are digested. Copepods are also diploid, meaning they have two copies of the whole genome. This is why the first hybrid generation is unaffected. They inherit one copy of the genome with a full set of genes compatible with their mitochondria. However, when female hybrids are mated with males from the paternal population, Compatible genes are progressively lost in the recombinant chromosomes, which is why such continuous back crosses are increasingly more affected. The opposite happens when male hybrids are crossed with females of the maternal population because these will inherit one full genome copy with compatible genes. This could also be an underlying explanation for Haldane's rule, which we mentioned in the Denisovans' tale. This rule says that among hybrid offspring of two species, if there is one sex that is non-viable or sterile, that sex is heterogametic, i.e. the sex that generally possess two different sex chromosomes. In most mammals, the male is heterogametic, possessing one X and one Y chromosome. Indeed, male hybrid offspring among mammals are more likely to be infertile or completely absent. 
In contrast, birds have ZW chromosomes, with the males having two large Z chromosomes, while females are heterogametic, having one large Z and one small W chromosome. Indeed, in birds, the female sex is most often affected by Haldane's rule. In fact, it's often worse for female birds than male mammals. But why is the heterogametic sex affected? Remember that in copepod species, the first hybrid generation is unaffected because each individual still possesses a full copy of the compatible genome. They don't have different sex chromosomes. On the other hand, female birds don't inherit two full genome copies since they only inherit one copy of the large Z chromosome. Here is the kicker. There are indeed several genes present on the Z chromosome that code for proteins of the electron transport chain. Bear in mind that females inherit the Z chromosome from the male parent. This means that if a female bird chose the wrong mate, all her female offspring may end up inheriting a Z chromosome with genes that are incompatible with her mitochondrial genes. This is less severe if males are heterogametic as it is in most mammals, which inherit both the large sex chromosome and mitochondrial DNA from the same parent. This doesn't mean incompatibility cannot occur in mammals at all, it just means that they are less likely to inherit an X chromosome that's incompatible with the mitochondrial DNA because the mother had to have survived while possessing both until reproductive age. Their compatibility was already tested in the previous generation, so to speak. This hypothesis is still subject to debate, but there are other facts that are also concordant with it. Another reason is that birds have very high metabolic rates relative to body size, among the highest of all animals. Their mitochondria have to perform exceptionally well to keep up with their energy demands. This would imply that they have a very low tolerance for genetic incompatibility. This high demand for energy, coupled with the fact that females have just one large sex chromosome and pass down mitochondrial DNA, could explain why the peacock and male birds in general have such vibrant colors and extravagant mating rituals. Female birds are picky for a very good reason. Plumage coloration may in fact be an honest signal of mitochondrial function since the production of many pigments and feathers correlates with mitochondrial performance. Furthermore, such signals also have to be unique between incompatible breeding populations, which could explain why color patterns are specific to the species and sometimes even subspecies. Could this also have been the case for the extinct relatives of birds, the other dinosaurs and especially pterosaurs who may have possessed the same sex chromosomes and similarly high energetic demands? Questions to ponder. In summary, female mate choice has been a powerful influence on the shape and colors of various animals and has likely operated within human evolution too. It may have played a role in the evolution of hairlessness, bipedality, and increasing brain size of hominins. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.